ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Mr. Sidney Brownwood. Hello and welcome to a very special isolation edition of the Two Fat Ladies podcast. And I'm here as ever joined with the Butch and Sundance of Wargaming. Hold up, not in Bolivia, but in Hertfordshire, I've got Nick Skinner and Richard Clark. Guys, welcome to the Isolation Oddcast. Hello, Sid. Hello, everyone. Yeah, different times, isn't it, eh? What set of challenges we're facing at the moment? We're having to uh, do the Oddcast remotely and cope with all kinds of changes in, in the world and with our families and with Wargaming in general. So... However, we have the technology to do this. We are somehow going to master the technology. With your guidance, Sydney, we're looking forward to you shepherding us through this remote way of podcasting. Richard, yeah. I can see you there making notes. How has it been for you so far, sir? Uh, uh, lonely, Sydney, lonely. It's, um, <laughs> no, it's been good, actually. I mean, I, um, I'm used to working from home on Lard Island, so... Uh, uh, nothing much has changed really, um, apart from the fact there's a few more people here. The wife's uh, self isolating from work, uh, in fact, we're all self isolating. Emma, who lots of people will know, my daughter, uh, who has helped out at lots of uh, shows, people will have seen her at Salute and at uh, Partisan, amongst others, um, is back from her world trip around. Uh, she was going to spend six months in New Zealand and Australia, and we've been desperately trying to get her back into the country so she came back yesterday she's self-isolating at her sister's flat which means her sister's moved back in with us here and she's working from home which means she's working from Lard Island so everything's changing it's all different but ultimately it's it's all good and it? it's all good as long as we're sensible I think the important thing is that we're all doing the right thing we are all self-isolating um, because that's just the way we've got to, got to rock these days. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good thing to do to stay indoors and to um, protect other people as well as ourselves. And Sydney, how are you doing there? You've been locked away in the wardrobe uh, for quite a while now. Tell us, um, how many notches have you made in the back of that wardrobe now? Well, this is my second week in the wardrobe. Mm. Um, I have actually left the wardrobe just for the recording of the Oddcast. Mm. Um, the isolation pod wardrobe is working very well at the moment. And I'm working from home. I'm quite enjoying not commuting. Um, it's obviously a completely abnormal situation, but I am seeing the kids who I don't normally see. Uh, because I'm normally at work late and they go to bed. And uh, the garden's looking good. And I uh, managed to get some hobby time done as well. So um, I'm also reuniting myself with my wife, who I never normally see. So I normally leave before she gets up. And um, I'm home and she's already going to bed. So that's quite nice. Um, the downside, I think, has been the lack of sporting activities. Quite a sporty person and do things with the kids in that regard. So that's been a downside. Uh, but other than that, <laughs> other than that, sort of muddling through as best we can in a, in a very muddling through kind of British way. That's uh, good to hear. Please, they do say... They do say that they expect the divorce rate to go up this summer. <laughs> uh, well, I think the good thing is we're all doing the right thing. And actually, because of, uh, because of these changes, we've decided to break away from the normal format in terms of what we do on the old cast. And uh, we thought we'd do an Ask Sydney. Sid, you've had, uh, you've had a huge response. We only went out yesterday, but already you're sacks are bulging away um do you uh we thought we, we thought we we wouldn't actually bother going to the workshop yet we could kind of maybe cover that and what some of the questions people are asking shall we go straight to your mailbag sydney and see what people have got to say well that's a great, great idea thank you very much um the ask sydney post bag has been bulging now we left it on the uh, doorstep so it uh, defumigated for a few hours before i ran into uh, the various sort of envelopes and letters and non-infected cardboard and have come up with about 20 questions from people all over the world who are keen to ask you to um and maybe even myself some things about what we're doing and um thoughts for the future uh, so we're going to start off with a very easy general sort of question from Steve Dix. Steve, hope you're very well. Um, Steve asks, 
what are the dynamic duo doing to occupy themselves during the lockdown? So well, I'm going to go to you first, Nick. Um, well, family um, is, is priority at the moment, but we're still finding ways to do gaming around the edges of that. Um, it does, I guess, offer time for us to finish lots of projects that are not yet completed, although we can't get together to play test or do any of that kind of thing. Um, we have been running, and I'm sure Rich will talk about this more in a moment, we have been running some Discord Kriegspiel for people to get involved with and to um, play online. Last week I ran a Discord Kriegspiel which was for the first time actually based on a historical, a, you know, a straight take of a historical scenario where we ran a game set around Operation Blue Coat and the breakout um, south through the Bocage with uh, I think nine or ten players taking on the role of a armor car recce troop pushing forward to try to exploit gaps in the line um, with um, Richard helping me out on that and um, it worked really quite nicely kept it quite short I needed it for a week involved planning for a couple of nights and then playing online for for another sort of four hours after that um, but that was really good fun and um, learned a lot. You know, wanted to make people think about the way that recce is actually carried out and how they do things um, and how that's a different set of challenges to a normal encounter battle. And of course, it's good to keep people occupied with things. We're looking online, aren't we, at the moment for ways that we can keep our gaming going. And that was a, a very easy and obvious route for us to look into initially. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Nick. I mean, I'm, I'm actually... Uh, uh, have been running since Friday a, um, a Kriegsville, a 1918 Kriegsville. So basically we're in the early summer in 1918 and we are looking at uh, the German offensive, trying to keep that going with the Allies trying to stop that. Um, and it's very much about the German attempt to capture Amiens. Um, and that's great. We've got about 20 people playing that. Uh, we're playing that on again on Discord. It's much more of a slow burner than the thing that Nick was running. Uh, we're really looking to play it almost in real time. So a week in the game is kind of a week in real life. It gives people a lot of time to uh, really get on with their lives and other things. Because I think one of the priorities at the moment is that whilst we are you know all, all, all locked down, in some respects it actually makes you know our working day a little bit harder, and in some ways things take a little bit more. I mean, we've really had to change the way we work. As Nick said, we're not able to, uh, to play test stuff other than on a, on a solo basis. Um, so it's, uh, it's an opportunity to do a lot more things like getting things laid, laid out. So the Far East Handbook is pushing on with that. I'm looking at uh, the start of laying out infamy. I've just been doing a little bit of uh, painting to, to uh, try and get my armies finished off for that. But uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to find other ways to get involved with the community and one of the things I'm going to be doing is producing a newsletter so people can follow the progress of what's happening in the 1918 campaign as it runs over probably literally months which if nothing else will give people something to read. The other thing we're going to be trying to do is do a lot more in the way of doing some odd casts. You know we want to maybe keep them a bit shorter and a bit sweeter but trying to do some odd casts to keep you guys informed and uh, give you something to listen to. And also, um, I'm going to be doing some films in the run-up to Infamy. Uh, so having a look at the armies that are involved, having a look at how things are based, having a look at how uh, you can put your army list together. So that will give people a head start, because I think a lot of people have got a bit of painting time on their hands now. So we're trying to do keep, carry on as normal by being completely abnormal and doing things very differently, but still trying to keep that wargaming content high. Oh, fantastic answers from you both there mm. and uh, I, it, obviously it's not, not the ideal situation that we're all looking forward to in a glorious spring and summer uh, but I think with a bit of imagination you know some good things can come out of it so staying positive I think is a big big um, important thing at the moment and both of you seem to be doing that very well so that's brilliant. Okay and our next question is from our very good friend Mike Hobbs and Mike asks um, once again He's picking up pen and paper to write to us so that he can ask the question um, relating to historical rule sets. There are two general types, according to Mike. First type, 
one that covers multiple periods. For example, ancient rules covering biblical to medieval. Second type, ones that concentrate on a specific period of history, such as Caesar's campaigns in Gaul. Each has pros and cons, says Mike. Type one, learn one set of rules and play across multiple periods, but lose the essence of what makes each army special and why they fought in such a way. Type two, you can drill into the specific period and produce something that models this, but maybe alienate players who don't want that particular period um, created on the war games table. So guys, I'm gonna ask you, which one is better? There's only one way to find out, Sid. Um, oh no, that's another program. Right, um, personally for me, I think Mike has answered, answered the question in his question. He says, um, learn one set of rules and play across multiple periods, but, and this is the key bit, lose the essence of what makes each army special and the way they fought in a certain way. That's it. So ultimately, one set of rules to rule them all, what we have are blue blocks and red blocks that we push around the table and we go red block is attacking blue block and it doesn't matter what the period is we just roll the dice and whoever rolls highest wins well uh, i am simplifying it to a degree there but for me what makes historical wargaming interesting is attempting to model what happened historically and therefore it's got to be the one that concentrates on a specific period of history. So, for example, funnily enough, Caesar's campaign in Gaul. I mean, I haven't gone that simplistic in, uh, with infamy, infamy, because obviously we, we're covering the Caesarian and early imperial period, but we are using that to focus very much on uh, that classic Romans versus barbarians period, although, you know, there's, there's big variations between what a Gallic army looks like and what a British army looks like and what a German army looks like. But I think by focusing um, on that uh, fairly tight period of military history, it allows us to create something that is historically interesting and stimulating. If you want to go wider, then you can create other supplements, which we're going to do. So Punic Wars, for example, and then go further east. Um, uh, wars in Greece. We can, we can do that. We can do that. But the key to making it interesting is having that historical relevance. So definitely type two, Mr. Hobbs. How about you, Nick? What would you say? Um, I, yeah, I share Richard's thoughts, really. I think what attracts you to, a, to uh, want to play a game is probably something quite particular. It's probably, you know, not a broad range of history it's probably something quite tight within that so for instance if i look at bag the hun for me you know it grew out of an interest in the battle of britain i wasn't really bothered about wider air combat to be honest it's more looking at actually want to play the battle of britain you start to write the rules of course and then people say to you well what about if we you know i'd like to take this and play it somewhere where i'm interested and expand it into um, another theater another um, area of fighting um, but I think that what fires the initial energy is, is, is being interested in something quite specific. And I think it's natural, therefore, that the, that the game or the rules that follow on from that are quite specific in their nature. And I think it's great if you can encapsulate that and keep the rules at that level. The challenge is, of course, that if you do that, commercially, they're not always viable. And a commercial set of rules, therefore, needs to appeal to a broader uh, range of people. And um, Mike's entirely right. You know, if, if you take a broad brush approach and you, and you say, well, this is, a, this is you know, covering 5,000 years of warfare or, or 500 years of warfare, you're going to miss some of those nuances. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, th I think for me, it's go detail wherever you can. But the reality of life is that you have to recognise that commercial viability is sometimes, um, sometimes influences that. I know, Richard, you've got something you want to say on that. Yeah, I don't think you're missing some of the nuances. I think you're missing all the bleeding nuances when you when you go when you go that vague, and, and all you end up is with is is with vanilla. When really, you know, or or more to the point, it isn't even vanilla because I really like vanilla ice cream. Of all ice creams, vanilla's my favourite. All you get is mashed potato, a big plate of mashed potato. You don't want that. You want the steak. You want the you want the chips. You want the, the you want the curry. You want the stuff. The flavour that comes through, not a big plate of mashed potato. I like raspberry ripple. 
oh no, no I don't like a raspberry ripple at all. I, I'm not bad with something like a caramel, especially a salted caramel, but no, vanilla is the king of ice creams. What about you, Sid? Ice creams? Uh, Fruity de Bosco sometimes, but uh, vanilla Ooh. is a definite favourite, yeah. Who? I like to, I like to have some variety. Who? Fruity de Bosco, maybe tiramisu. Yeah, Fruity de Bosco? Is that like rum and raisin? No, no, it's got cherries in, mate. It's got cherries right. in. Okay. Not quality ice cream. Don't worry about it. Well, you can get cream for it, can you? <laughs> well, let's move on from that question. And uh, let's go to one from Mike Steele. And Mike asks, very quick question, this one. Any chance you guys are actually going to finish the Jean Bleu Gap? Not now. <laughs> Especially if we're dead. <laughs> That's a quick answer. That's, that's the answer, Mike. Um, moving on to Dominic Quast in Bavaria. Dominic's relatively new to the Ray of Lard. And, oh, sorry, I seem to have missed out, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think Mike deserves a slightly better answer than that. Uh, <laughs> the, the truth is we have got one Jean Blue Gap game in the bag that's, um, that's being edited in inverted commas, <laughs> uh, but I don't know when we'll be able to do the next one or how, it, that might test the boundaries of our technology. But there is there is one in there, at least, that we think might be able to get out um, sometime soon. Okay, Sid, sorry, uh, go back to your other one now. Well, on, on to Dominic's question. Um, Don, Dominic's relatively new to the world of Lard, but he's in South Bavaria, and um, his gaming group is focusing on Operation Market Lardum. Uh, sorry, he's not at all, it's Operation Market Garden. <laughs> um, <laughs> slight slip there, apologies everyone. Um, and Dominic says, can he have some insight um, as regards, I think, the Arnhem Market Garden book that you produced, it, what battlefield scenarios there'll be, but also he says, how also do you set experience levels for troops? Um, and I think a comparison between, well, what about elite British paras and as opposed to the 9th Hörstaufen uh, division? Uh, what mechanics lead from historical sources um, to getting things on the table when you're looking at different experience levels for troops? So, Nick. Yeah, uh, let me answer that first of all from the from, uh, perspective of what's in Market Garden. Well, one of the reasons why it's taking so long is because it's got nearly everything in it. Um, it covers the entire operation from end to end. It won't do it in one big supplement it will be um, multiple supplements we think simply on the scale of the operation um, but we're probably looking at uh, 40 to 50 sort of individual based scenarios in the main campaign leading up to and around Arnhem so that would include the breakthrough from um, from Joe's Bridge to Valkensvard then we've got actions around Son Bridge and Best with the 101st Airborne, actions around uh, St Odenroder with the 101st Airborne, actions around uh, Vagel with the 101st Airborne, we've got um, actions uh, around Eindhoven where the Germans attempt to cut the road and there's tank battles with Cromwells, we've got the actions around uh, Grave Bridge uh, in the um, Grus Beek Heights and, and German troops pushing out of the Reichswald. There's fighting in Nijmegen. We've got fighting uh, across the Vaal. The Vaal. The Vaal River crossing is in there, but not in the way you might think it, it will be. Um, there's fighting on the island. There's fighting uh, in, in, in around the landing grounds, Wolfhazer, um, pushing into Arnhem and around Arnhem Bridge. There isn't really any part of the Arnhem campaign that isn't covered in some shape or form, which is why, of course, it's taken us so long to finalise it, because we want to make sure this is comprehensive and, and give some good quality, historically based um, uh, scenarios. One of the greatest challenges is around maps and making sure that we've got you know, detailed maps, accurate maps, but also maps that can be recreated on the war games table, because some of the terrain is quite specific and quite tight and quite difficult to do. So trying to turn that into something that we think gamers can actually reasonably be expected to put on their table is also part of that. So I think that answers the first part. Um, as to troop qualities, well, we know that troops um, uh, are labelled as, as elite or, or, or veteran, but sometimes the way they perform in he, these historical encounters makes you wonder how they get that label, how they get that tag, and that's certainly true around some of the Arnhem operations. Uh, but I'm going to hand over to Richard to answer the rest of that because it's, the, um, it's a more difficult question, and um, I don't want to be that tested by it. Rich, let's test your brains. <laughs> 
Well, actually, funnily enough, we did talk about this when we were in Arnhem last time. If you remember, we had a rather uh, lengthy discussion uh, once we were driving from Arnhem to Crisis, um, thinking, rethinking about the concept of elites. Um, and, you know, the, the way that my mind came down to it is that you've got, you've got elite in terms of high quality leadership, which gives a certain dynamism because of the energy injected into a formation by not just the man at the top, but also the men uh, who are commanding that, uh, that, that whole formation. You know, if, if the guy who's the commanding officer has got his management team, to use a, a modern parlance, right, and has got them thinking in the right way, where they, they understand the way he thinks, they know intuitively how he's going to be reacting, uh, then that can be an extraordinarily dynamic organisation, whatever the quality of the troops. And it's interesting, you see this quite a lot at Arnhem, where you get, to, you get troops who are you know, in training, who operate relatively dynamically because of the high quality of the leadership. Then again, you've got elite, which is, um, I'm never going to surrender. And I think this is where the parachute regiment come into it. You know, they just dig their heels in. And frankly, some of their leadership isn't that dynamic. But they do dig their heels in and they die in a ditch and they're prepared to do that. And they're never going to uh, uh, surrender uh, you know, until obviously the point when it's beyond all hope. Um, and then again, you can get troops who are elite in terms of their equipment. They've got all the toys. They've got all the bells and whistles. How you reflect that in terms of a, a scenario is that I think you need to um, you need to be driven by what was happening historically in a certain situation. I think it's quite naive to say that any formation is elite all the time. Um, and, and you can see units which have got a tr tremendously good reputation um, in, in North Africa and Italy becoming very sticky once they get to Normandy because they've just gone past their sell-by date. Um, what, what mechanics lead from historical sources to gain mechanics, I think was the question that Dominic was asking uh, down in Bavaria. And I think the answer is mm -hmm. that you need to deal with this on, on a, a multiple, uh, multiple levels. And I think one of the things that we've, we've reflected in the 1940 handbook, and this is something that's going to be coming through in the Arnhem campaigns as well, is that things like force morale can be a, a way of reflecting a, a particular unit. You know, you can have units who retain a very high force morale until absolutely the last minute, or you can have units whose force morale starts pretty high, but once they get a couple of knockbacks early on, that can drop very rapidly. And then again, you look at the leadership, uh, and then again, you look at the, the training of the men and the way they operate. So I think you need to... I think you need to have more than the, the single approach of just calling people elite or green. And this leads on to another question that we had from G. Bards, um, mm. really on about uh, how do we think that troop quality from raw or levy or militia right through to elite, how is that adequately represented in most wargaming rules? And I think that's a more general question that G has asked us rather than just two fat lighting rules. How do we feel as regards rules that we've played in the past, that troop quality is reflected. I mean, we'll remember back to sets of rules in the 80s, maybe, which were all going to search group, the A, B, C, D, E system. Uh, we might remember troop categorization as being elite, trained or raw. How do we feel that, that reflects, um, or how satisfied are we with that? Richard, go to you first. Uh, in, in the 1980s, I had a Ford Escort. Um, I don't have a Ford Escort anymore, so I think it, it's slightly unfair to compare uh, rules today with rules of the 1980s because, you know, technology, is, technology has moved on in car design, but also the way people think about war games has moved on. So I certainly wouldn't want to be critical of any of the rule sets that, uh, that anybody played in, in the 1980s. But I do think... Um, do like to think that in wargaming generally things have moved on and there are different mechanisms that you can use to reflect you know the, the quality of troops so for example if you were looking at looking at sharp practice you know what what uh, what cards you're holding in your hand what those cards do how many cards you have uh, is is a way of 
is a way of um, introducing the concept of quality into those games, which is over and above that classic morale um, uh, rating, A, B, C, D, E, which, which was very linear, but that's, that's not a criticism of it. That's just where design was in those days. But it was very linear. And I think, I think people thinking outside the box have found different ways to do that now. And I think that's really positive. There's, there's some interesting ideas around. Nick, any thoughts on that? I've got nothing to add, really. I think I'd, I'd echo what Richard says. Um, we tend to think of, you know, top, middle and bottom, don't we, as, uh, you know, somebody's better than somebody else and somebody's always worse than someone else. So uh, various rules cover that in various different ways, troop characteristics, morale types, um, elite, average, poor quality troops. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing more to add. Very good. Well, let's not be too um, weighty and too uh, carefully calibrated. We've got a few fun questions as well interspersed amongst the, the more thoughtful ones. Richard, question for you. Given your views on real ale, mm. would there ever be a time when you'd have to choose between a flagon of Frumbolter's Black Sock or a martini? Um. <laughs> Uh, I think the answer to that is I would never drink Thrumbolter's Black Sock. I may have a martini as uh, an aperitif before dinner in the right circumstances. Given the choice, I'd rather have neither. <laughs> very, very good answer. And Nick, question of course for you. <laughs> <laughs> if you were a Soviet-era tractor, Nick, which would you be and why? That one. <laughs> I don't know anything about Soviet era <laughs> tractors. I'd be a big tractor with um, with leave lots of um, uh, what was it? leave very deep furrows. I suspect in my wake. Very I good don't answer. know what kind of question is that. Who sent that in? <laughs> that question was from <laughs> Gareth uh, in Wales. I'm not sure that was Gareth Beamish. Uh, good to hear, okay. Gareth. Pleased to use in your time self-isolating usefully. Thank you very much. Um, let's go back to some care. more. Uh, hold, some on. More hold on. Hold oh. on. Um, before you dismiss that question so early, can I uh, point you to the article by Wayne H. Worthington, Soviet Agricultural Tractors and Equipment, um, which was published in 1960. I think you'll find maybe all the answers that, uh, that you want to know there. Uh, Wayne, Maybe that's well, a pseudonym that, for Gareth, who knows? Sorry? That will fill the gap in my reading that I'm looking for. Cheers, mate. Thank yeah, you very no, much. No, that's a pleasure. I think, I think we should all turn to Wayne H. Worthington on that subject. Excellent. Well, back to a question from Rob Fielding. Um, for those embarking on infamy, infamy uh, during this hiatus, good that Rob describes it as a hiatus, I'm sure it will be, um, Rob asks, a uh, very good question, could you share how the launch army lists, uh, so, pardon me, could you share how the launch army lists look like? That's I could, you, but, but I'm not going to, and I'll tell you why I'm not going to, because I am going to be doing some filming for Lard TV this very week, where I'm going to be running people through lots of the different starter army lists and the support options to tell them where they can go, and it would be a terrible shame if I said it all here and then filmed it all again and people would be bored to tears. So I thought rather than me talk about it on audio, they might like to see me displaying it all uh, in vi on video. We always like you displaying everything you have, Richard. It happens <laughs> many times. It's never an anticlimax. So that's, that's good. Um, Tom McKinnell asks a really good question, um, which I thought about a number of times. I think we might have actually discussed it on the, on the last big drinking session we have with we had with Dave Minty Brown in fact. Um, Minty, like a, Minty. A month ago. <laughs> Minty. Tom, Tom Minty. Max. Hello Minty. All right Minty. Hello, Minty. <laughs> uh, well, on the 13th of February we went out with Dave Minty Brown in London in Covent Garden and that's quite a quite an interesting long day of uh, drinking and eating. <laughs> Must be our last <laughs> for some time. <laughs> it did start at eleven thirty in the morning, so it's possibly a little bit uh, a little bit longer than we'd be managing now. Now our livers are recovering. But anyway, Tom asks the excellent question: Any thought of integrating the rules for campaigns between Chain of Command, IABSM, and O Group 
so you can scale the operations to suit. Ooh, Nick, you're clever on this one. Well, yeah, it's an interesting idea, isn't it, actually, how you can pull, the, pull those threads together. Um, the question, I think, is particularly about campaign, isn't it, how you do that? Well, uh, maybe that's an interesting project to think about over the summer because the, the campaign elements within uh, Chain of Command are well defined with the sharp end, of course, will give that to you. Um, it wouldn't be that big a task to actually extend that um, either way. We've seen people uh, sharing sort of cross um, breeding the rules. For instance, in Lard magazine, the last Lard magazine in 2019, um, Desmondo did a piece around uh, combining I Ain't Been Shot Mum with Chain of Command, which um, gave quite an interesting game, I think. So, only reasonable that you could combine some of the campaign characteristics. Why couldn't you? Why couldn't you actually? Um, yeah, campaign it so it's almost embedded. So you could have the the uh, sort of battalion level campaign within which you've got the platoon level campaign and even the company level campaign for IBS seven. So it's it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, fun. I like the idea of it. I, I do like the idea of it. I mean, I think it. Uh, I don't know that we could produce a formal handbook on how to do it, but I think it would be really interesting for somebody running a campaign to go right. We've got a big action happening here. Oh, look! Uh, what I want to do is I want to send my guys out and uh, send a platoon out on patrol to check out that ground before we launch the attack, or or even even I'm a Panzer commander and I want to um, go and recce the ground. There's all sorts of options, aren't there? Quite interesting, quite interesting. I think that's one of those things that the more you think about it, the more opportunities leap out and thwack you in the face. So that's, um, that's a great question. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you for thwacking both of uh, our guests in the face. That's always, uh, that's always a good thing to do. Um, and then we've got a question from Welsh. Welsh Jeff in Carmarthen in Wales. Good oh. to hear from you, Jeff. Given the chance to do a newer version of an older rule set, with no commercial constraints or current projects to interfere with, ah, which set would the Lardies like to revisit? Nick, that hand was up faster than a rippet after a hair. It's got to be you first, sir. Kiss me hardy, no question. Um, absolutely, question about loving to love the idea of revisiting Kiss Me Hardy uh, and bringing that really into line with modern thinking. Very good. So, Richard, any of your older rule sets you want to revisit? Um, I've always wanted to revisit algae. Uh, I've got a hexless version in my head and in notes, which I've never got round to doing. Um, I think the fun of First World War aerial wargaming is what really appeals to me. It's the it's the Biggles algae and ginger ginger doing their stuff. It's not about the formations of Bag the Hun. It's much more about prototype, if you like, aerial warfare. And I just love the idea of using it specifically um, for things like uh, reconnaissance and not just doing fighter against fighter. I'm really interested in, you know, the idea of holding off an enemy, enemy fighters long enough to, to let the balloon go down and, you know, the observer to reach the ground safely just some integrating algae in with the very concept of trench warfare and how trench warfare differs in terms of, you know, maybe having, having an old Halberstadt up there in uh, controlling an artillery bombardment. And once, it, once it's forced down, the artillery bombardment has to stop. I just love the idea of that whole first world war thing that you can write scenarios which are a lot more about what's happening on the ground and how the air integrates with that um as opposed to just fighter on fighter action so for me algae is quite a sexy one that i'd like to do personally i'd love to see if the lord spares has uh, done and i'd also like to see a uh, chain of command and mud and blood kind of melded together into mm -hmm. a chain of command first world war what about you nick i think you've got something to say yeah, well, you mentioned uh, If the Lord Spares Us, which is um, still an area of the First World War that's massively underrepresented on the war games table. And I'd yeah. love to see that um, that sort of being played more often. And, and if and if a, a new version of If the Lord Spares Us would uh, be a catalyst for that, then that's something I'd jump on board with straight away. And the next question, um, which I think is um, a good question, really. Uh, really um, very much in tune with where we are. Um, 
being self-isolated, Sean Randall asks, which Lardy rule sets uh, do we think make the best solo play experience, bearing in mind our current climate? Um, so Sean, we met up only a couple of weeks ago, and it seems a lot longer ago than that. Uh, wish we could have answered that question there, but it's a perfect question for self-isolating wargamers. So Nick, going to go to you first. Is that Sean Patient Zero, Randall? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, actually, I think the activation methods of many of our games work well for um, self-isolation. Water tanker, for instance, um, because of the alternating way the play runs, uh, can really easily be played uh, solo. I've played it quite a lot solo. In fact, many. I don't know if you remember, Mick Rich, but ages ago, I I, um, I made a film about doing solo water tanker. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if that still exists somewhere. Um, and there's, uh, I think, IBSM. Any of the card-driven systems, of course, work, lend themselves quite nicely to um, solo gaming. And I don't, I don't think there's any of them you couldn't do. with. You might need to be a bit fertile with your imagination. I've also seen people playing games via internet link. Um, I don't quite know how they're doing that. I know that some guys are playing games via YouTube. Um, don't know if there's any larger games being paid that way. It'd be interesting to know. But certainly, uh, yeah, I'd go for... Water tanker, keep it simple. Um, play that really quickly after dinner. Get some of the kids playing it. I'm even going to get my kids playing it over this extended period if they're not careful. We're having a games challenge in our house um, over the over the coming weeks. We've already got the league table up, and Dad is ahead in the game already. I won the Uno Championships on the, on whatever night that is Saturday. So why not add water tanker to that list? I might even have a chance of winning that one. I think, I think that's a lovely idea, actually. Um, my, uh, as you know, Emma's self-isolating over at my other daughter's house. So, but after two weeks, when she comes back and we're all still here, maybe we'll start something similar because that is a bit of fun, isn't it? But yes. do something to brighten up our days. I think it's good to have. I think it's good to have things on your schedule in the day um, that you go right now. It's time to do something, so you're not just sitting and lounging about. I've sit. Saw a friend of mine is saying. Uh, he and his family are doing a film night every night and they're picking a film that they want to see and they're watching that particular film. Because these days with online streaming and all that stuff, you, you're not relying on what's on telly at any point in time. You can pretty much pick up anything you want. So I think it's a great idea to do things, to have some kind of um, regime, if you like, some kind of uh, uh, plan of doing things during the day. Um, rule sets, getting back to that. Card-driven systems that have a lot of narrative in them are brilliant for a solo play because you are almost watching the action like watching a film like that film in the evening you're watching the action unfold before your very eyes so uh something like sharp practice i think would would keep me really enthralled and entertained on the long nights when uh, when we're locked indoors i think that's right isn't it those card driven rules which mm. you can intersperse with those an appropriate level of random events uh things which break up the turn sequence i think those are absolutely uh, the sort of rule sets that really do play well with solo and i think we've all used those from time to time to develop scenarios um i remember doing a lot of the modern blood scenarios testing them solo first uh, and card driven systems really did help in that regard so yeah. nick i think you had a quick point there, mate no no i just wanted to ask you sid do you think you'd be playing with yourself more in self-isolation than you did previously or or is it still going to be something that's a, a theme for you um always has been a theme playing with myself i can imagine my, i i'm probably doing a great deal more uh, which leads us on to another question uh, so benito in madrid hello benito uh, benito asked me uh, i think whatever happened to the set of rules i was working on with kurt campbell uh, from the analog hobbies painting challenge um, based on the Thirty Years' War, the wars in the 17th century. So those were in two mil, and we played uh, uh, about three, five or six times Lutzen across the country, certainly at one of the Operation Market Lardens, and I think we played it at the club, and uh, played it at a couple of friends' houses as well. Um, so we will probably be getting back to that. One of the target dates in my calendar for this year was White Mountain, uh, which is in the autumn of the year in 1620, so it would be great to do a game of White Mountain. I think we've got all the figures for it which is the first big battle in the Thirty Years' War. Um, but those rules, I think, have laid a bit fallow since 2016, 2017, when we played them last. So anything with two mil, easy to put up, or six mil, pick up, put down, clear away, uh, very easy to do. 
And those smaller scales, I think, if you still want to have large battles, they work very well in a situation where you may be isolated in a house and able to get to a club. Uh, and we, I think we'll certainly be picking those up again. And they, again, were card driven with some random events and some hopefully unusual novel um, rule mechanics in them. So Benito, watch, your, watch out for that because that will be coming, uh, I'm sure, later in the year. So the answer is nothing. When Benito says, what have you done with these rules? The answer is nothing. I've done nothing. Why not say it? <laughs> I'm not going to say that because it's not true. But Steve J in Manchester asks Nick a very similar question. So Steve says, can I ask Nick when he's going to get his finger out and finish that YT build? He's had six months. <laughs> well, I assume he's referring to the Charlie Foxtrot Hotel, um, the first half of the build for which is on YouTube. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to finish it. Um, why would I not be able to do that over the next six months? And I really need to. It's currently in a um, really useful box, um, along with everything else. Uh, so it will get finished off, I think, in this period of um, isolationism, hopefully. And uh, yeah, I'll be filming that. And uh, I'm sure you can't wait to see what it looks like. The other side of that, of course, is there's really nice models doing rounds at the moment. Lots of really nice toys coming off um, and being made not only by the sort of MDF manufacturers, but also by 3D printers. And the quality, I think, of tabletop buildings is just going to get better and better. Um, so I better get that finished. He's right. So something to look forward to then, which I'm sure will be absolutely terrific. I mean, in a general sort of point, um, Leslie Tipping asks, is there going to be more extra content available on the Two Fat Lardies websites and web locations while the crisis lasts? I mean, it's probably useful to have an idea about what you're planning in that regard. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons that things have gone a bit quiet on the uh, Lard TV front is that we've been so busy with uh, infamy, infamy. Uh, and of course, that's been driven by playtesting, which is, you know, as you get stuff back from playtesting, you're looking at issues that come up. It's just really a case of constantly fine tuning the engine now until you, until you get it right. But of course, when you can't play test, well, that hopefully you're going to have opportunities for other things. So we're going to be doing some filming about Infamy Infamy. Uh, obviously, that's going to be, uh, we're going to be doing that uh, on our own, each of us in our own way, hopefully making our own contributions. But yeah, it will be good to have that what i'm keen to do is to produce some stuff going with these uh campaigns that we're running uh on discord with other people and hopefully um just generally producing some additional stuff uh to reflect the times and circumstances but that would be good and that's certainly our plan starting this week fantastic um and a lighter question but one i think is very useful David Hunter asks, which force, be it army, regiment, or other formation from any period or setting, do you think had the least practical uniform or clothing, and why? Ooh, least. I would have thought troops with stocks in hot weather must be horrific. So red coats at the early part of the American War of Independence, the heat of... Uh, uh, that you get up there in uh, over there in uh, United States of America, what is what was then the colonies, is so uh, extreme compared to anything we experience here in the UK. And if you're having to do that in a formal uniform, made worse by the fact you've got leather stocks around your neck, that must have been a horrific experience. Yeah, Nick, any horrific, least practical clothing uniforms um. you can think of? Uh, well, dressing up in general is quite horrific, uh, but I would say some of those Renaissance units that have those bizarre outfits, they've got to be the most ridiculous things imaginable, haven't they? I mean, Sid, you know more about that than I do. Yeah, plunder hose and an enlarged cod piece is for land snacks, probably. I'd go for 1914 French Army and white gloves. I thought that that was ludicrous <laughs> and impractical. Um, and um, very traumatising if you're a fashionable person. You know, once you've got your white gloves, once you get them dirty, I mean, that's... That's very distracting and that's terribly impractical. I mean, if they're, if they're dark lead, you're not so much worried about it. But the last thing you want to be doing on the battlefield is, is looking poorly turned out when you're in charge of uh, bodies of troops. Now, that would be uh, really disappointing. So white gloves, I think, must be right up there with uh, the least practical uniform from 1914. Uh, but good question, David. We can think about that further and very welcome too. Um, 
another slightly light-hearted question from our good friend John Emmett in Virginia. John oh. asks, many of us cooped up indoors for an undefined period of time. What are your top three historical fiction films or television series? Oh. Quickly now, chaps, there's a time limit on that. Can't just spend all day. I'm going to go, who am I going to go to first? Not Nick. me. Uh, okay, so this is top films, is it? Films or TV series? Yeah, okay. Um, well, my, everybody knows, I think, or most people will be aware, uh, my favourite film of all time is She Wore a Yellow Ribbon by um, one of the John Ford Westerns starring John Wayne. Uh, Cavalry on the Great Plains, so that would be my top one. Bridge Too Far, obviously, is absolute all-time classic film. Um, and then I guess if you're going to go for a third film, well, I don't know, I, 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 Carol and Carver, does that count as a historical <laughs> film? I'm not sure if it does, um, but I'd gladly watch it again and again and again. I think it could be inspirational, though, for wargaming, some of those some of those films like that. TV series, well, Band of Brothers, I think, probably has everything in the bag, doesn't it, in terms of, in terms of um, uh, Second World War. Um, yeah, what about you, Rich? Um, well, when it comes to war films, mine's not a classic, mine's not a typical war film. Um, <coughs> it's a Cold War film. Um, I really like those Michael Caine films from the Len Dayton books like The It Chris File, going back to the early 60s, just because I felt that not only are they interesting stories, um, but because, for example, The Icarus Fire was made in 1962, it really is made at the height of the Cold War. So you are really getting that feel of uh, that particular period. And it's interesting, you know, I show that film to my kids, and they're in their 20s. It, it has very, they're amazed, they're amazed by it. In this era of uh, what until recently has been totally free travel, you know, a uh, world without borders, the fact that, um, that the world was as it was in, in our own, well, almost our own lifetimes, uh, is quite remarkable. And I, I really like the gritty black and white nature of that particular film. Um, series, um, I don't know. I don't watch a great deal of television, to be honest with you. Um, so I can't really add very much to that. I, I tend to find myself really enjoying things when I watch it, and then it doesn't really register with me. I think, oh, that was good. Nick? Um, I just want to say The World at War, although not a drama, is obviously one of the best things you can watch for Second World War history oh. uh, on the telly. It's available as a box set of DVDs and it's bloody brilliant. And it's brilliant because they interview a lot of the people who were there. Uh, yeah, and the BBC also did another series narrated by Richard Burton on The Great War, Sydney, which I know you've got on, on DVD, mate, haven't you? Um, I have got, they're both very good. I mean, both the, I think it's called the Great War, maybe. I think it um, might also be called the, the Great Second War. World War. I mean, they're both really good. I prefer um, the Great War one, if I'm honest. Um, but what I do find interesting about the world at war is um, the fact that you are seeing, uh, you know, they're interviewing somebody about the U boat war and they're interviewing Admiral Donitz. You know, that's, that's just kind of <laughs> mad crazy, isn't it, really? Yeah. the the BBC series was called The Great War, um, and it was originally released in 1964. Um, and again, you know, if you think about that, somebody who was 18 in um, 1914 um, would have would only been in their mid 60s then. So you you are getting people who actually took part and have got real memories of exactly what happened. And what I find really interesting about that that series is that there's none of your lions led by donkeys. They're not talking about that. They everybody everybody who they're interviewing, you know, from the private soldier on the ground to you know, the more senior people, recognised the fact that they were going through a huge learning curve, and it wasn't easy. But it certainly wasn't lions led by donkeys. I think that's a fabulous series. And if you are stuck indoors, as we're going to be, that is a huge series. Get that on DVD or whatever, and you, that'll keep you busy over the next months. Yeah. The um, so the Great War is a, is a fine series. I mean the. The episode I remember on that is the one on Passchendaele, which John Terrain wrote. Um, and he didn't go down the revisionist approach to Passchendaele at yeah. the time um, the programme was made. He went down much more of the learning curve. Yeah. Um, and there's that's actually interviews with uh, soldiers who've been at Passchendaele there. Yeah. And like with the World at War, it has access to 
uh, many of the guys who were probably middle ranking officers um, and also politicians who were in the Great War who were speaking on that series. And that's definitely uh, worth looking out for. I've got three as well. So I, I, I did mine for John. So I thought um, slightly different approaches. Mine are all slightly more escapist. Uh, La Reine Margot is absolutely fantastic on the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. It's a brilliant French film. If you've not seen that, that's really terrific. Um, also Kingdom of Heaven by Ridley Scott and the Crusades. That's a really, really good um, film, especially if you get the extended DVD version. Had a lot of scenes cut from it. That's beautifully shot, really interesting. And also for a TV series, if you've not seen the Canadian series, The Borgias, um, that's really, really good. There's an original from the 80s on the BBC, which isn't bad, but The Borgias with Jeremy Irons, I think is a really good costume drama, which has some, some fun bits in it as well, and a bit of military style stuff. Nick, I know you're desperate to get in. Sydney, I am so glad that I am not self-isolating with you. <laughs> self-isolating within the self-isolation of the wardrobe somehow. What was that film? Uh, La Reine Margot. Wasn't that the it's, same ice cream that you mentioned earlier? No, it's set in 1572 and it's the St. Bartholomew's Massive Day Massacre in the French Rules of Religion. It's a very, very good film. It's one of my favourite yeah. French films, but we don't How's want to that a laugh a minute. <laughs> Fantastic it's, it's not got many laughs in there's, there's certainly some massacres, but it's a really, really good film. Nick. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is. Also worth saying, of course, John is in uh, America. He's in Virginia, I think, isn't he? He um, is. Uh, yeah, so home of the uh, you know many, many battlefields of the American Civil War around there. I'm sure the Americans listening don't need me to tell them that there's the great series caused by Ken Burns, which is about the American Civil War called the Civil War, which is brilliant. And he also did one, didn't he, on the Vietnam War, which is a very interesting study of, um, of, of that. So, uh, yeah, um, that's going to be something that Jordan, I'm sure, is aware of. Richard, what do you want to say? Um, well, I'm just going to say, if John is looking for um, uh, 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 films or TV programmes that would reflect where he comes from in Virginia, he could watch The Virginian. Uh, which was um, uh, a mysterious man enforces law and order in 1890s Wyoming, uh, which ran from September 60 through to, through to March 71, and uh, included Doug McClure as his sidekick, Trampus. Trampus, I remember. Yeah, exactly. So, there we go, John. If you're watching in Virginia, you can actually uh, watch a programme named About You. So that's a perfect ending to John's question. I got a question um, from friends of General Haig. Quite a specific question, this one. Worcester 1651 is a classic example of deploying a pontoon bridge of boats during a battle. Are there any others? Um, what Would that be a good scenario to investigate? Or is it too fiddly? Um, so in Worcester in 1651, there are two bridges of boats which are deployed. One is on the team and one is on the confluence of the seven. Uh, the team one is smaller, that's about five boats wide. Uh, the one on the seven is about 15 boats wide. Um, and they are put in place in the middle of a battle and a forlorn hope crosses um, both of those um, to fight the Scots on the other side. Uh, the Scots are in Worcester, which takes a bit of explaining, but it's the third English civil war. Um, but glossing over that fact, it, I thought it was really, a, it's, a, it's one of those things which happens in a battle which it don't need to be specific to a pontoon bridge construction, but it's really an engineering task or some task at its most basic, you've got an engagement and something's happening in the battle. Um, so it's not just two sides lining up, but somebody has to do something. And I think those in types of things happening in battle are always interesting because they complicate what would normally be a simple plan. Richard? I think that's the type of action that's really worthwhile fighting, but would you necessarily do it in a tabletop game? Now, for example, Nick was talking about the Discord campaign that he ran, which was about a reconnaissance uh, you know, uh, he had a recce squadron operating in front of a, or hopefully in front of a, a British division in Normandy in July 1944. It's the type of thing that, you know, would be quite difficult to do on the tabletop, but doing it on a map game, and especially using a period 1944 map, um, and using a, a Discord setup which replicated the wireless net that was there in 1944 meant that we could examine that and, and, and play a game that was, that was interesting and fun and enhanced our understanding of what was going on. I think maybe taking an engineering task like that is exactly the same. 
is exactly the same. It's the type of thing you can gain, but maybe not in a traditional tabletop fashion. Nick? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking particularly the, the, uh, the Vile River Crossing in 1944, you know, near Nijmegen. We've all seen it in the Bridge Too Far film, and Robert Redford, Hail Mary, full of grace, paddling across, etc. Um, absolutely pivotal moment in history, but it doesn't really make a great war game, um, does it, necessarily? You know, pushing some dinghies across a big a big river and of course a river like the Vale is, is wide um, these terrain items take up big space on the table um, what's more interesting is the actions that happen once they get across the river and they're able to push into some of the German positions that's when you get some interesting war games that come from it so the engineering feat itself may not be worthy of the attention uh, it might be that the attention is better elsewhere um, so yeah and these things take up as i say big chunks of table rivers take up big chunks of table bridges take up big chunks of table um and they kind of minimize the options to, to play games around that is my thoughts yeah i think uh, worcester's a good example an interesting example because it's actually a bridging task completed in the face of the enemy so the scots held back on the one bank and they didn't attack the bridging um so it is an unusual example of construction of a bridge on the table and the team but i agree with you both i mean i think it's certainly a task which is interesting in a campaign because where those where did those pontoon boats come from or those boats and where does the where do the engineers come from i was reading an account of another battle the other day that uh, there were for example around the siege of dunkirk in 1659 there were plenty of mortars but there were no fire workers so there were nobody who actually could use the mortar <laughs> nobody could set fire to the mortar bombs to be inserted and all of those things you know play into a campaign you know where is your pontoon train where are the engineers who are able to use that or is it just sort of useless stuff which is in uh, the train itself anyway so a good question there uh, from the friends of general haig andy um and we're on to uh, one of the next questions again from the welsh frizz himself mike Hoss. Mike asks, uh, I think by Twitter, as rules writers who spend months and years crafting a set of rules and playtesting until it's perfect, how pissed off do you get when some random person asks the question two minutes after they've been released, can I use it for insert random historical period? Is that an annoying question? <laughs> asks Mike Hobbs. Nick? Um... It don't bother me. Don't, no. Well, no. I, I, is it an annoying question? No. Um, I guess what's annoying is the fact that maybe you haven't thought about it before they've asked it. If, if, if there is an application for the rule set that you've overlooked, then you've missed something. Um, but people wanting to say, can I take this and apply it to something else? I'd say, yeah, go for it. Give it a go. See what happens. Um, you know, if, uh, you're, you can create this stuff for yourself as well. All we give you, we've said this many, many times, is a toolbox of ideas. You take that toolbox and you apply it to whatever games you want to play. And if that means you want to tweak it in some way to reflect a particular aspect of a particular war or battle or force, then that's up to you. You've, 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 you've got the product. You use it the way you want to. I think that's absolutely right. And I think rather than annoying, we should celebrate the fact that people are looking to diversify and change the way things do to suit what they want. It's, it's, um, I think that's a positive thing about the hobby. One of the great things about the hobby is it, it isn't chess, where we all have to stick to the same rules, like it or not. For example, chess, great game, but I hate the way a knight moves. I can't go, I'm going to change the way a knight moves in chess because I don't like this two up and one to the side. I'm going to change it to this, whereas you can in wargaming, which is brilliant. The only thing we'd ask, I think, is, is if, if people put some thinking power into that and they create something that enables them to use it. That's the, exactly the kind of thing that we'd like to include in a large magazine. Because oh, yeah. there will be other people that will want to, want to share that or other people for whom it will stimulate some ideas around campaigns and battles that they want to fight. So if you do that, that's great. But please share that thinking with us. Uh, there are many, many places where lardies hang out online. But there's nothing uh, quite like putting it in live magazine because that brings the attention of many more people than even those individual chat rooms. Right on. Um, a question uh, I think we've all been thinking about as well um, from Olv in Norway, who we met down in Southampton just two weeks ago. Hello, Olv. Um, Olv mentions that he wants to spread the lard around in town, uh, but not many of his mates are interested in collecting historical figures. 
Um, all of these are, I guess, probably in his early 30s when, when we met him. Uh, so definitely of a slightly, slightly, just slightly younger generation than us. Um, but certainly from a sort of uh, a, a generation which is both familiar with things like um, Warhammer and um, fighting giant stompy robots with warm hordes and war machine. Um, but also many of my mates aren't interested in collecting historicals. So I collect both sides in a game system. Do you think it's absolutely necessary to be interested in history to collect and paint a historical force? Not really. Uh, I think it helps. I think it provides some motivation, doesn't it? I mean, to be honest with you, I, I think more about, oh, that's an interesting period of history. And that's what then drives me to think about what figures are available. Or maybe sometimes I look at the figures and I go, oh, they're lovely figures. And then I think, but is it, inter is it an interesting period? So then I go and look. So you can, inspiration can come from many angles, so to speak. But I think ultimately, um, it, you get more fun if you, if you dip, your, dip your feet in historically, even if it's just buying an Osprey book and having some appreciation of what, what, it's, what the battle you're about to fight is all about. That makes it so much more interesting, so much more interesting. And the great thing, of course, is that you know, there are unlimited number of books you can buy for inspiration on the historical front, as opposed to with fantasy, you tend to be reliant on what's, um, what's provided for you. Okay, one thing I'd say is that um, a lot of fantasy um, environments or worlds have a historical basis in them. So Tolkien, as well known, was really a, an early medieval scholar and uh, there's many many elements of the Lord of the Rings which are based around um, sort of 8th or 9th century Saxon England especially the writers of Rohan. Um, all the Conan books have sort of elements which are taken from history. Uh, the Game of Thrones trilogy obviously has lots of historical inspirations in some of the different factions and uh, war bands which are present there. So there's a lots of things which are crossover points I think uh, for gamers who've been exposed uh, to sci-fi fantasy gaming to step into a historical environment. Um, and once I think you start, there's lots of opportunities to do those both at the same time. It's not a question of having to do one but not the other. Richard. Just a quick one while we've been recording this. I've just had a message from Alan up in air, our good mate at the Air War Games Club up there, and saying, look after yourselves, lads, keep well. All the best to you. So while we're on here, I thought we'd give a big shout out to Alan and Doc and all the other guys up there in air and say, you know, keep, keep it real, guys. Get yourself in isolation. And when it all finishes, we will get that suitcase open and have a good old drink. So very, very, very best wishes to Alan and all the guys up there. Um, one of the other questions I had, um, it leads on from what we were talking about with Ol, um, and that uh, portly plod, hiding in beds, which I think might be uh, a pseudonym for Alistair, um, asks, Sid, you're famed for your imaginationary fluffy feathery stuff. Thank you, Al. How do you feel about what if alt history in historically accurate campaigns, or is there a clear line between gaming historical and imaginary conflicts? Um, that's a really good question. I must say that when I think about alt history, I really think about tweaking history not really changing it. I'm not a huge fan of fantasy for its own sake or just things which are completely imaginary but what I do really have a lot of fun with thinking about is what you can introduce into a plausible and indeed accurate historical time frame to recreate things which could have happened but didn't happen. Um, so I remember one of my favourite one of my favourite alt historical scenarios is in one of Partisan Press's um, books of scenarios for the English Civil War and it's the action which never actually took place in 1659 when um, General Monk and Thomas Fairfax um, could have led a force of troops down to London to face the Republican government um, led by John Lambert after the, after the abdication, I think, of um, Cromwell's son. Cromwell had died. And that was a battle which never took place. But there's a really great scenario in one of those partisan press magazines which deals with that battle. So it's plausible historical things which could happen as opposed to just completely imaginary, uh, which are things that I think you can, you can definitely play around with and, having a lot, and have a lot of fun with. Um, and I think possibly our last question 
Um, we have just one question left. Dice Dad in Cheshire. How is it possible to accurately depict asymmetric warfare in a rules system and how successful do you believe you've been in doing that? So who's going to answer that one? I think that's pointing at Nick. Um, how difficult is it? Very. Um, and they, by their very nature, give a, give a game that isn't balanced. Um, however, they can really create some interesting challenges for people. And we've, we've attempted in the past to, to put some methodologies in, uh, methodologies in for this even, um, in terms of uh, thinking of Charlie Don't Surf, the work Richard would put into, or you put into, to fighting season in particular as well. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. And sometimes what comes out at the other end isn't really... Um, workable uh, but it sets a certain amount of challenge for sure i'm waffling now richard help me out i mean it's, it's a tough one isn't it it is a tough one yeah i think you really have to distill it back and say what matters i think you have to what really matters to those the people who are taking part in the fighting and uh, and the, the, the big thing to be avoided which we've seen so many times uh in war games is you know you you can't try and say oh yeah but okay but these are the particularly elite um rebels who've decided they do want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the government forces when that's you know potentially not what happened in the war that's often people want to fight the fight they wanted to fight you know if only those bad guys would have stood up and fought it out with us uh, we'd have beaten them so let's make them do it on the tabletop but it's not about that it wasn't about that ever and you know you have to recognize the fact different different imperatives are, are taking place Nick. Yeah, and that's what you see a lot in some of the Vietnam rules, isn't it? You know, we see lots of T, you know, whatever they're called, the, 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 the Russian tanks, you know, overriding the fire base. Well, we see that quite a lot in, in Vietnam games. Um, but, yeah, you're right. I think it's, I think it's the, um, it, it depends on what platform you choose. So, for instance, I'm looking at some of the games we've done via Discord, where actually you really can build up that um that, that feeling for the asymmetrical warfare really well you can you can because it's not about figures on the table it's more about a political movement uh, to some degree and how you can lobby support or momentum or influence morale of people or the enemy or your own troops etc uh, and you can do that much more effectively i think through some of the online mechanisms than you can on the tabletop and i think um very interesting to see how this period of the next however many weeks or months this may be where we're in uh, is this isolation is view. Um, I think our definition and our, our views on war gaming are probably going to have to change and expand somewhat. We are going to be using different technologies and different approaches to playing games. That will drive innovation in game systems, I'm sure, mm. because um, you know, we, we, nobody will be sitting idle or will they waiting for, um, uh, you know, just this happy happy nirvana at the end of this where it all comes back to normal while the world will be different uh, we suspect after this and the way we play games will probably need to shift as a consequence of that and um, some of these online platforms are going to probably come into more uh, uh, evidence as a, on the back of that as long as there's pubs we'll be all right a pub <laughs> what's a pub? a pub as long as there's pubs after all this the world will be fine i don't remember pubs what were they like I've not been in one for 10 days, I must admit. <laughs> well, we've, just got, we've just got time for a couple more questions. A very quick one from Martin Lefebvre. Um, if you ever had to game the Anglo-Dutch wars, which war, which rules, which figures? Um, so we're going to deal with that quickly. Third Dutch war, uh, Sol Bay and Texel has to be. Uh, which rules? Probably make, you up on your, uh, make them up on your own because it's uh, pell-mell sort of action all the way rather than fixed lines of battle. Uh, complete chaos. Um, but very interesting engagements. And which figures? Um, one and 2,400 scale ships um, uh, would get the real scale of those huge titanic mercantilist engagements. Um, so that's the quick answer to Martin. And then we had a last few questions sneaked in by Twitter from Tom up in Sheffield. Um, two questions. What are good sources of random events to throw into our games? Oops. And also... What are the <laughs> books? Thank you. And what are some of the challenges in your current project you're enjoying solving? What are some of the problems and challenges you're both enjoying solving? That's that's really interesting that somebody would ask the question there and say they're enjoying solving because that's exactly what it is. That's exactly the joy of designing a set of rules. It's reading the history, reading what 
pattern and then trying to reflect that on, on the tabletop. Uh, for me, funnily enough, links in with the, one of the previous questions, it's the asymmetrical nature of those aspects of ancient warfare where you have civilised people fighting against barbarians. Now, I actually don't accept either of those terms, but let's use it as shorthand. Um, uh, but yeah, it is a challenge and it's interesting. And yes, it is asymmetrical and therefore you have to have two quite different systems in terms of the way they fight. That is that is great. Getting, reading those histories, especially the ancient histories, and creating something that replicates it. And when you when you get that game to the point where you go, I've done it, is, 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 is a joy, it really is. So uh, that's the general answer. I can't remember the question. Nick? I think I think the uh, the challenges um, uh, are around the the endless quest for for what actually happened, and to try and let you unravel an action. For instance, you get one action described by uh, one person who was there, and the same action described by somebody else. You find another source, and you get another narrative on it. When you lay all these narratives on top of each other, you do it in the hope that you're going to get. A clearer picture of what actually happened well of course you don't you just get more views from different angles and it's it's really difficult to try and make sense of that and, and that's that's a continual challenge to kind of well you know we, earlier on we asked about what makes troops elite and how do you classify troops etc you can only do it by by depth of reading and understanding and try to apply some of that thinking and yeah. so that's always a real challenge the other one that i really am facing at the moment which is tough and i mentioned it again earlier is um taking some battles and some actions which are geographically quite complicated and putting them on a tabletop in a way that most gamers can sensibly expect to recreate that terrain without having to spend hundreds of pounds doing it and that's always really tough i personally uh, you know always try to look at the historical maps and we'll try to put that historical map straight on the table but for some scenarios that's just too testing um, but I, I always keep it there as an, an aim and as an ambition to do that. I personally really dislike seeing other games when you know you sort of open a campaign supplement and you look at the battlefield and it's supposed to be a certain encounter which you think you're quite familiar with and you think well, that doesn't look anything like that. You know, uh -huh. the actual terrain looks nothing like that at all. Uh, and so you know, I'm, I'm sure, and I'm sure people open our terrain, open our scenarios, and say exactly that same thing sometimes. Um, and that's because it's a hard thing to get right. That's really important. What was the other question, Sid? I've forgotten the other question. The first part of the question was about what? Uh, the first part of the question, which was asked by Tom in Sheffield, um, was, uh, I'm just trying to, remember, trying to get it here, uh, what are some good sources of random events for oh, our yeah. game? To which Richard yeah. just shouted, books! Well, books, well, he's absolutely right. It's not, not, but the books you want, though, are the ones that give the uh, sort of first-hand accounts, really, because then you can yeah. get the ones that affect on the level you want to look at. So, for instance, the recce game we've recently run on Discord, um, if you read the Household Cavalry uh, reports of it, you know, small things happen. The number of times that people drive their armoured cars into a ditch seems to be quite amazing. Um, and, you know, a lovely, lovely story about some guys who, who were driving down a country road at full pelt, turn around the corner only to face themselves with a German field kitchen coming the other way, <laughs> which uh, completely discombobulated them would be one term you put for it. Uh, and led to a story about the fact that the field kitchen was still being used many years later in the French village uh, nearest to where this action took place. So little random events like that will come out of narratives. Uh, always go down to as low a detail as you can get, and that will give you one or two things that you can throw in there. And they'll also be um, scenario or campaign specific, of course, if you do it that way. Uh, diaries, letters, yeah. Yeah. Um, journals, those yeah. are really the heart of all of those. Um, and it's those little snippets which come out from that. And sometimes it's diaries which aren't really talking about campaign at the time. It's things which are just mentioned in, in letters after the event or diaries kept after the event. Um, and a little goes a long long way with random events uh, random events and events which are themed particularly to the context of the action which is being taken so it doesn't necessarily be, need to be a random event from the battle you're representing uh, it could be a random event from that period or from that war and they go a long way nick and of course in some situations in some situations what you want it's not necessarily the random itself doesn't really matter the random event itself doesn't really matter it's the fact that you're making um, you're throwing something else here. You're throwing a bit of friction into the command decision making. So the actual random event itself 
is it doesn't really matter that much is the fact that the commander's suddenly got something else to think about which is taking up his or her time um, which means that it's more difficult to focus on their key activity absolutely so that brings us to the end of our post bag it was bulging at the start and now it's been emptied of all the questions that we've been asked um, but it's moving on to lunchtime uh, and it's probably about time for us to say goodbye um, but also to um, make sure that we see all of you again and uh, wish you all the very best and very good health uh, for the foreseeable future. Nick? Yeah, and I think probably the message that we should send out to people is that, um, yeah, it's quite difficult at the moment, but if uh, we follow the guidance, which I think is really important, uh, because we know that um, yeah, as a community, uh, we will be going through some tough times and we want to be supportive of each other during that. So I think these online methods of casts, connecting up on Twitter, Facebook, etc., is even more important at the moment. And so we'd love to hear more from people and keep those dialogues going. And let's stay safe, people. Yeah, yeah, important to remember, you're not alone. There's a big community out there, uh, not just the Lardy community, but the Wargaming community and the community in general. You know, we've got that opportunity to keep in touch with the ones we love on things like, uh, uh, you know, FaceTime uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and let's not forget about that. Let's, let's keep in contact, uh, but let's keep safe and keep, uh, keep ourselves isolated and following uh, government advice wherever we live in the world. It's important to listen. And if anybody manages to use this time to actually finish off their lead pile, then we'd love to know about that. Yeah. Yeah, how likely is that? Most of, most of us have been collecting for about 30 years, but it could happen. Somebody may actually get to the end, but I hope that if they do get to the end, they just buy some more anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's all from us. So uh, until next time, and there will be a next time, um, I wish you a very good afternoon, evening or morning, wherever you are in the world, and we'll have Roger Barraclough and the band maybe playing us out. In tonight's show, Sydney Roundwood was joined by and Richard Clark with music by Roger Barraclough and his band. <laughs>